Okay, so lightning talks for September 28th. Continuing the ground rules. So I'm going to create a thread in our Google chat space for each of the talks as they're going on. And uh, if you have any comments or questions or compliments, please feel free to post them in that corresponding thread for that lightning talk. The author of the lightning talk won't obviously respond during their talk, but after they'll respond to any questions or comments that you have. And we're recording the meeting. So if you're not already in the lightning talks space in Google chat, send me a private message in Google chat at this point and I'll add you there uh, so that everybody's ready. So what are we gonna talk about today? Finite state machines and you, that's Jared, growing our team with Christina, the Django REST framework with Ryan Friedman and optimistic concurrency control with Joel. I am going to stop sharing my screen and Jared is going to start sharing his screen. And Jared, whenever you're ready, take us away. Testing, testing. Can you see, hear, and read me? I see and hear you. Oh, I Excellent. see your screen, yes. All right. What is a state machine and why should I care? Was what I wanted to name this talk, but I felt it made for a better opening line. And here we are. Uh, hi, this is State Machines and You. I am Jared Money. This is my first tech talk, so please be kind. Uh, and I am a software consultant here at Solution Street. I specialize in uh, front end development, specifically React, and I work on the Bright Cove project. So, what is a state machine and why should I care? Uh, it's a very good question, fictional voice in my head. This is a state machine. And if you're like me, the first time you look at it, you go, oh, and also, oh, <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff to do. And this looks interesting into the folder of aspirations it goes, probably never to be seen again. So let's start with what does a state machine help us with? A state machine helps us with things like this. Who's seen things like this? Who's written things like this? Who has written tests to make sure things like this work? This is a reality of our job, of drive-by contributing, of deadlines. This is realistic code with some creative liberty taken. State machines help us get the state out of what is happening here. This is a path that we know our users will be on but it is not clear to us, those who are setting them on the path easily, what is happening. So what is a state machine and why should I care? This is a state machine and you should care because it stops us from crashing into each other. Every time you hop in your car, you're interacting with state machines and relying that these other people that you never see do as well. Here we have a state that says stop. It has a known transition into green. Green says go. Green has a known transition into yellow, which means hurry up. My wife, said that might not have been the best joke. I don't even think I made it up. I think that came from somewhere, but we're sticking with it. This is the classic state machine. You transition from one state to the next in a defined known machine. I will not go from yellow to green because imagine the chaos that would ensue if I did. It's a very simple thing to not go from yellow to green, but Tell me if you can guarantee that's not gonna happen with this. So what is a state machine and why should I care? A state machine are these three things, states, stop, start, hurry up, transitions, the unidirectional transitions between them and actions. In the case of a stoplight, the action would be the cars go or some event occurs because the state has been successfully transmitted. This is not scary. This is a, a, an open field for us to explore, for us to, to, to benefit from. The, the fruits of our labors to learn it are greatly outweighed by what we get back from it. So this is X state. Promised you it was coming up at some point. X state is a JavaScript version. It's a JavaScript framework for state charts, for finite state machines. They are finite because much like the Stoplight, there's not infinite states. David K. Piano is a very smart guy. He talks about very cool things and works on neat projects. I highly recommend following him on Twitter. The homepage for X state is right there alongside the very helpful visualizer 
which you've seen a screenshot of. So speaking of, let's take a look at that a little more closely. We're not going to get technical. Um, I don't want this to be a technical talk. I want this to be a talk about technical things. So here we have four states, idle, loading, success, and failure. Idle can go into loading. It's very straightforward. Loading can go to success or to failure. How though? How does this occur? Well, if we look over at how this stuff, oh, I didn't realize clicking would do that. If we look over here at the states, here we're defining idle, loading, success, and failure. For idle on the fetch action, go to the loading state. Black and white, clear as day, you hand the machine the rules, yellow is never going to go to green in a situation like this. At least it will have a, a much harder time so long as you abide by the rules of the library. You'll notice something neat here, though, in 43 seconds to remain. On retry, we do an event, an action. We perform an action. Setting off actions is the primary purpose of a state chart. Welcome to on enter. Welcome to on exit. On enter and on exit allow you to do all the things. Talk to a database, make an API call, um, um, send a tweet. <laughs> That's where you do the things that matter in states and transitions that you can rely on. I hope the value is becoming clear. So what is a state machine and why should I care? A state machine is a really cool piece of tech that's worth learning about because it can make our jobs easier. This has been State Machines in You. I've been Jared Money, and thank you very much for listening to my talk. That was awesome, Jared. Thank you. Um, my editorial, if you and thank you to Arthur for reminding me of this. If you ever want to see one of the funniest things you'll ever see in your life, go to YouTube and 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 put a search in for what does a yellow light mean and add the word taxi and you'll see one of the funniest little bits on the sitcom you'll ever see in your whole life i promise okay up next we have christina and christina go ahead and share your screen and take it away awesome hello everyone all righty uh let's see one moment i'm just uh okay is the presentation uh viewable all right, great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Christina. Um, I'm the recruiting coordinator here at Solution Street. Um, I'm coming up on my one year anniversary with Solution Street, which is really exciting. And I've certainly learned a lot in this past year. And um, I just wanted to do a brief lightning talk presentation to give you a little bit of insight into behind the scenes of uh, our recruiting and, um, you know, share, uh, you know, kind of a, a little bit about our process and you know, uh, how we find uh, new great people to work with us. And so uh, a little bit of overview on what we'll talk about. Um, first, uh, how we find our candidates, um, and then moving into the value of referrals, both, you know, keep, keep finding people within our network. Um, then what makes a great consultant, like the qualities of the people we're looking for. Um, and then, uh, you know, our strategy of recruiting, we kind of believe in a long term relationship approach to recruiting. So I'll kind of discuss that in more detail. Um, and then lastly, a little bit about the types of roles that we look for at Solution Street. Um, so, yeah, starting off, you know, how we find great candidates. Um, there are kind of like three main ways, um, you know, the obvious one is, um, you know, candidates that apply, whether it's through one of the our job boards like Indeed, through, through Indeed, uh, ZipRecruiter, LinkedIn, also, um, you know, on our company website, there's a way for candidates to apply directly there. And that's like, you know, people that are in the job market actively looking, you know, they're knocking on our door, you know, looking to apply. Um, I kind of focus on that area um, throughout my regular day to day work. Um, and then the next, you know, category would be what we call sourcing, which is Solution Street is proactively reaching out cold to candidates that might be, you know, out there that could have really great skill set. Um, my colleague Cherry kind of focuses a lot of that in her in her day to day work. Um, but, you know, that would be like um, reaching out, you know, maybe doing a search on LinkedIn recruiter and looking for people with a skill set that would match one of our job posts. And those candidates may or may not be actively looking, but, you know, we, we kind of want to let them know that we're interested in talking to them. And then the third kind of main way um, that we get qualified candidates is through um, referrals through our network, whether it's um, employee referrals, you know, meaning um, people here on our team 
uh, reaching out to people that they might know and, and recommending them or, you know, perhaps externally, like, um, you know, some of our clients sometimes refer candidates or people in our network. Um, but that's actually, you know, our highest success category of finding really great people is, um, you know, through our referral network. And so I kind of wanted to dive into that a little bit more in this lightning talk. If we could clone you, we would. That's what I wanted to express here. You know, everyone that works here at Solution Street is just so fantastic, um, you know, and, and I wish I had a cloning machine, you know, to just kind of like turn out more great people. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, you know, a Dr. Evil situation here. I can't make mini me's out of all of you, but, um, you know, I wish, you know, we had that capability. But I think that's why referrals are so great because, um, you know, it kind of, cuts out a lot of the noise in our recruiting process. You know, we kind of get to higher quality candidates a lot quicker that way. Um, so yeah, um, you know, basically um, I kind of wanted to talk about referrals. You know, the people you know in your network, they might not be actively looking, they might be passively looking, or they might not, you know, I guess there's different, different stages that people might be in, you know, um, and we just wanted to express that, you know, even if someone is not ready to, you know, apply, send the resume right away. Um, we are open to kind of providing information to them, even if they're just a little bit curious, like maybe they have some questions, um, you know, that before they commit to fully applying and going through an interview process, they just want to learn a little bit more about Solution Street. Maybe they have some HR benefit questions that they want to take into account. Um, you know, our, our HR team, we have an open door, you know, um, if someone just wanted to chat briefly and, and, you know, learn more about us, we are definitely welcome to kind of share more information with them. And um, sometimes it's about timing, you know, like, um, perhaps, you know, you have a, a great, uh, you know, uh, team member, somebody that could could be great on our team, um, and they have a certain skill set, and, you know, um, you're able to share their resume with us. But, Maybe we just don't quite have a good position at this point in time with one of our client projects. Um, you know, we we want to um, you know let you know that we value you know that relationship, that connection you have with that person, and you know we would love to kind of keep in touch um, in the long run as well. And so, um, you know, even if it, it doesn't necessarily work out for just that first day or that first moment of of being introduced to a person, you know, we kind of see the bigger picture. And then also, you know, when you refer a candidate, um, if you have experience working with that person, if you know what their work ethic is like, um, you know, we, we can fast track the interview process for them. Um, you know, um, for technical candidates, you know, a lot of you are familiar, we have the, the middle interview technical screen. Um, but, you know, if you're referring a candidate and you have experience working with them on that project and you know that they're good at their skill set, um, you know, you're, we're, we'd be very really happy to kind of fast track it and just go ahead after a quick intro call with me, you know, I can help get um, schedule them to meet with our leadership team. And so um, we just want to know that we value your time um, and, and your connections and, and you know, we want to appreciate uh, your efforts there. Um, so uh, just to go over a little bit about, you know, what makes a great consultant at Solution Street, I think a lot of you are familiar with this already, but, um, you know, um, it's kind of first and foremost, great communication, you know, is the person able to carry themselves well professionally, you know, are they able to speak clearly, because, um, you know, this would tie into, you know, those consulting skills that are so important working on client projects. Um, and then, you know, in their skill set, you know, whatever area it might be, whether it's development work or other roles on the software team, you know, um, are they fairly strong in their skill set? I would say typically, you know, when I'm looking for candidates, you know, we look for candidates that have at least three to five years of experience in their role. Sometimes we can go a little bit under that if they're really exceptional, but, you know, we, we kind of want people to be able to hit the ground running on their project. Um, and then, of course, you know, aligning with our core values, as you know, um, our core values are honesty, respect, transparency, dependability, and fun. And so does that person kind of, you know, align with that? You know, do, um, do, you, do you feel like they would be good on the team? You know, or would they be fun to work with? You know, are they responsible? And, and so those are all kind of important things. Moving on. Um, so yeah, I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you know, uh, sharing more about our relationship approach to recruiting. And so um, whether it's through re referrals or even candidates that come through the door through other ways, 
you know, we believe in a long-term kind of approach to our recruiting connections. And so, um, you know, when we meet candidates, we get to know them, we get to learn what their strengths are, what their skills are, and what they're looking to do. And our goal is to hopefully find a great match, you know, um, of a project that, you know, would suit well for what they're looking for. If, you know, we didn't quite have that puzzle piece fitting, that that good connection, that good first position for them, you know, we would still love to keep in touch with these people. And whether it's staying connected on LinkedIn or, you know, even just us casually reaching out from time to time, maybe in a few months after their first interview, you know, we would love to kind of keep in touch um, because if there was a good opportunity for them in the future, we would love to, you know, consider them. And we've hired people through that way. You know, maybe a few years after their initial interview, something better came up and, you know, we were able to kind of, you know, form that relationship and um, bring them onto our team. And then um, lastly, I just wanted to share a little bit about our current opportunities at Solution Street. Um, so, you know, we kind of, are always interested in meeting people in all these different areas. Um, you know, we have uh, lots of roles right now for um, development managers, project managers, and scrum masters, as well as business analysts. This is a great one, business analysts for referrals, because typically we don't necessarily post those jobs um, out into the world. We, we reach out to our network first, um, as well as like um, automation engineers and manual testers, product owners, of course, software engineers, um, some of the technologies for software engineers, we're always you know, interested in meeting people that work with C-sharp.net, maybe front-end projects like Angular or React, Python, JavaScript, Java, and um, lately a couple projects using Golang as well. And then um, of course, the summer internships. Um, you know, during the summer, you know, we have uh, the great internship program where we you know, bring on a few uh, students that are currently enrolled in, in, in university. Um, and they, we know we bring them aboard to uh, work in the office with us. And so, yeah, that's a little bit about us. You know, if you have any questions in particular about our referral program, um, you know, or incentives involved with that, you're welcome to reach out to Katie Schumann, our HR manager. She can provide a lot more information um, regarding that. Um, and then any general questions, you know, or if you have referrals, you're welcome to send them our way. Um, I've put my email address here. It's just clittle at solutionstreet.com. Uh, but yeah, thank you for your time and thanks for letting me uh, show a window into my world. <laughs> thank you, Christina. And uh, yeah, congratulations on almost one year. When is when is your one year anniversary? I need to look at the specific date, but it's like in October, I believe, early October. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we, we work uh, very closely with Christina and finding candidates. It's great to work with her. She's extremely professional, extremely well prepared for everything. And so if you have people that you know that you think might be a good fit at Slew Street, send them on. Uh, we treat everybody very respectfully when we go through our candidate process. And I think it's usually a pretty good experience for everyone, regardless of whether we bring them on. Okay, up next is Ryan Friedman. So Ryan, if you can go ahead and share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. Can you guys see the presentation? It is starting, but we don't see, up. Oh, there we go. Wait, there we get, go. And Sweet. We uh, you should see DRF, TLDR. Um, so the, the reason I chose uh, the Django REST framework, um, and I will go to the next slide so that you can potentially go to the next slide, um, so that you can see some of these acronyms and definitions, uh, is because uh, there's there's a, a little bit of a disconnect, at least I found when I was learning Django um, and Django REST framework, and what is Django, what is Django REST framework, what is it used for? And I came from sort of a, a more... Um, a less abstract background, uh, a lot of Go Golang, Python, or C++, and Python I use mostly as like a utility language. It's a very general purpose, um, dynamically typed. It's it's easy to use. It is easy to get started. Um, and Django REST framework makes it even easier if you are looking to set up a REST API. Um, the abstractions made it a little bit difficult um, at the beginning because the the framework is actually pretty useful across the board. Um, and in order to not uh, pigeonhole any of the individual components that uh, are associated with the Django REST framework, the documentation can be um, very high level, uh, let's say, um, in terms of uh, both of the examples and um, other things. And you have to kind of dig down. So this is for those people who will be using Django, Python, and have not read the documents yet, or documentation yet. Um, so what is Django REST framework? It's basically a toolkit that makes developing web APIs 
easier. You can still do uh, REST development. You can still do Django. Uh, run. You can still work with Django, Python, obviously, all that without DRF. Um, and uh, we have the sort of database compatibility um, and the different environments you can work in. So this builds on top of sort of the migration infrastructure and things like that uh, that Django has. So when would you use Django REST framework? I've talked about this a little bit already, but you would need a web browsable API. So for instance, if you want uh, in your development environments or your integration environments to be able to have uh, the API endpoints, both with description and web surfable, um, then Django REST framework is great. Um, you need to manage uh, a complex object serialization. Um, so the I'll get into serialization later, but if you need the basically the stuff in your database to take a slightly different shape or a very different shape when going from database to user. Um, this is extremely helpful for doing that. Um, sort of a, if you're developing a RESTful API with Python or Django, um, or if you wanna just write less boilerplate, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, different ways to hook up REST APIs, obviously. Uh, but if you want to get to MVP, this is a, a very, fast way to do so uh, to get an API up and running if uh, if you know sort of where you're at with the framework once you get used to it and get working with it. Uh, key components of the DRF, there's way more than just what I'm going to go over in here, but because it's a lightning talk, I'm only going to go through the rough idea of what serializers, routers, and views are because that really encompasses the idea of where Django REST framework fits within a Django application. Routers, sorry, the you know, you guys can't see it, but everybody's face is in the way for me. Um, so routers are, it's its fairly straightforward. You use a router and you get a request coming into the API um, and you want that request to reach the functionality somehow. So you, a router is used to route incoming requests to things like views, view sets, functionality, which we'll get to in a second. So if you can set up a default router, register uh, either a view set or a view, custom URL patterns that either have you know example views or or uh, like uh, other other components that are compatible with Django REST framework, um, login, logout endpoints, things like that. Um, and views and view sets. This is where I got co uh, confused when I was first learning Django REST framework or learning of the toolkit because I don't know if I could claim that I know everything uh, about it or, um, but the views are the sort of most basic construct to handle an incoming request. You have a, you have a, the example view up here is a good example where you have uh, these permission classes that you can associate with a view. So if I want to be authenticated or if I want to only allow API keys or both, um, and then you can define your get and post uh, behavior in this view. So it inherits from an API view, which is a parent class, which gives you a bit of uh, extra functionality. Um, and as you saw on the previous slide, that a example view is just uh, set up to this API endpoint through the router. So now when somebody comes into the API, request API slash example two, uh, get request will go here. It'll look for a query parameter named foo ID, something I made up to abstract this. And then it'll look inside of your database where this would exist for your models and get the example object. Um, if the query parameter object didn't exist, you have these built-in sort of response and status objects, which is kind of nice. You don't have to write out, you know, anything too complex or you can respond with data as well. Um, view sets are a little bit, uh, they're, they're a little bit simpler and a little bit more complicated at the same time. Uh, they're used to construct the, or they're, they're also a construct to handle the, the request, but they come with more functionality in the box. So this comment view set is, it's, uh, I would say, uh, um, modeled after something that exists in production. Um, so this is the comment view set. If you want to retrieve comments by a specific user, or if you uh, you can do that by overriding the get query set, um, implicitly a view set will respond to the create list, retrieve, update, and destroy models without you having to write anything, um, which is kind of nice. So this comment view set is built on top of a serializer, which we'll go through in the next, um, in the next slide, which indicates how to uh, modify incoming and outgoing user uh, data for the user from database constructs. So in this case, a comment. And here we see, okay, well, we have, uh, when we want to view a comment, we're looking for, let's say, an invoice here. 
and we only return the comments associated with the invoice supplied. So we look for a query parameter, and if we don't have one, then we just return everything. If we want to construct a comment, same same deal, um, where this has an implicit creation function um, that's based on the serializer. Um, it's a little bit complicated to describe like that. Um, you can also do fun things where you have uh, custom actions, which I don't have on here because it would have taken up the whole slide. Um, but you can define an action that is specific to a view set or a view um, that will allow you to uh, have custom behavior for, for the various endpoints. So we have an internal user that hits one of our endpoints that needs the data in a different shape. So we use a separate serializer in that action in order to change the shape of the data before it gets back to the user. Um, next up is serializers. I'm doing this fast because it's a lot of data to con condense into a five minute span. But essentially you have your models and all that in the back end and your data outgoing to the API or uh, from the API. Um, and it allows these sort of models and query sets to be serialized and deserialized into Python objects, which are representative of the, um, the actual content in the database. So um, there's, there's lots of fun things you can do with a serializer. Uh, for instance, you can make read only fields that exist from another uh, linked object. So if you wanted the name of the invoice to appear in every comment from the previous slide, then you can make a read only field that refers to the invoice and the name of that invoice. And it'll come back when you request a comment on the API endpoint just by supplying this field here. You can do formatting within date time fields. You can do uh, method fields that allow you to you know, uh, find the last user uh, in this example or, uh, or anything you want to do. If you, we have, a, we have a, an invoice roll up that when somebody re uh, requests on like a, like a sales endpoint, you can uh, get, get a high level summary of all of the invoices associated with a, with a group. Um, you can define creation uh, hooks for uh, the uh, for the serializer. So if somebody's coming in through the API endpoint and posting on this comment view set, then or the example view, well, there was an example view set, um, then you would be able to uh, customize the the creation um, after the data has been validated. And validators are another thing entirely where they can be built in and modify your data and do lots of fun stuff. Um, update hooks are also fun. In this example, we're not allowing the, this is, it's a bit of a contrived example because you can define straight state transitions for content inside of the database. But in this example, we're checking to see what the instance status is. And if we're in the final status, we're gonna raise a validation error and not allow the user to update. Um, otherwise we can just pass through the validated data. Um, so sort of a TLDR to the TLDR would be views and view sets, perform actions based on user requests, router matches URL patterns to functionality, and a serializer uh, is for shaping the model data, either incoming or outgoing. Um, so there's that's not everything in the toolkit either. There's schemas, there's response objects, there's uh, API testing helpers, which is always nice because people often, a lot of the time overlook tests. Uh, there's custom pagination, filtering, and I'm sure more than I've remembered to put on this slide. Um, but that's pretty much it. Hopefully the the this commercial for uh, Django REST framework will have convinced you to try it out. Thank you for attending the lightning talk. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Okay, we are on to our last lightning talk of the session, and that is by Joel. Joel, you're still on mute. I guess it helps if I unmute. Can you guys see my screen? Now we can, yep. And we can okay, move. great. Uh, so here, I'm here to talk today about optimistic concurrency control in five minutes or less. So uh, what is optimistic concurrency control? Uh, it's often called optimistic locking. It's a method or approach to protect data from being overwritten by multiple users in the same system. It typically leverages a database column on the record to be protected, usually either a counter or a timestamp. 
Um, most systems have data that's shared by multiple users. If this data is highly contentious, often written by multiple users, then a more aggressive locking scheme should be used. If not, then maybe optimistic locking can help. So I want to give an example with, without optimistic locking. Uh, you know, yesterday at breakfast, my wife and I were talking about getting some money out of the bank. And as usual, I was half listening because I hadn't had my coffee yet. And we talked about getting $100 out. Uh, and I kind of thought I was supposed to get out, but she was telling me she was going to get it out. So at lunchtime, I went to the screen on my bank and decided to take $100 out. But I got distracted and uh, lost my train of thought. I left that screen up. Meanwhile, my wife came in and went to the screen to take money out. And uh, she was uh, looking up something on her computer and needed a few minutes before she hit the go. And meanwhile, I came back from my distraction and took the money out and you can see at 12.10, uh, I got the money out and our balance is now $50. A couple of minutes later, she hits the button. Uh-oh, we're overdrawn because she thought we had 150 still in, but it turned out I'd already taken 100 bucks out. So now we're negative and the bank is gonna call and yell at us. So this is, a, this is an example. If you didn't have any kind of locking, what could happen, what could go wrong, and you could have some angry customers. So what do we want to happen in an optimistic locking world? So what we want to happen is kind of the same thing. I should be able to go into the account. She should be able to go into the account. We should be able to start a transaction. And basically the first one of us to do it wins, right? That's the that's why it's optimistic. So if I got there first and took the 100 bucks out, what should happen is when she goes to do her withdrawal, the system should detect that the bank account has changed. The amount, the imbalance amount has changed since her initial screen was rendered and it should say, hey, sorry, we can't let this go through um, and give the user a warning, probably not in green, but uh, I was in a hurry, so maybe in red and say, hey, the record has changed um, while you're writing it. So we've reloaded this record for you. Please review the new balance before you make this count. So now she would see, oh, wow, the balance is already $50 out. Something happened. Let me go figure out what it is. So. How do we how do we accomplish this? What's what's the approach we take to solve this problem? There's four easy steps. The first step is you add a database column to the record you want to lock, either an integer or a timestamp. You propagate the object version from the database to the UI, and then you add a where clause when updating in the SQL to check against the version to see it, you know to make sure you're not updating the wrong version. And you handle save failure. So if for some reason there was a mismatch on the update, we need to be able to reload, reload the object and present the error to the user. So easy, right? So uh, I'm going to give you a Ruby on Rails MySQL example. So add that lock column to the database. As you see, Ruby Rails likes it to be called lock underscore version. Uh, you propagate the object version of the client UI. In this case, I just stick a hidden field in the UI. You can see here down at the bottom, uh, the hidden, the version of my account is 15. So when I send that back to the UI, that's hidden, hidden in the form. Step three is in the where clause, uh, check that version. So basically, again, Rails does this automatically for you when you, when you use the right uh, naming convention. Uh, and if for some reason no record gets updated, then I know my lock version is out of date, and then that should trigger step four, which is handing, handling a save, save failure. So in, in this case, what I'm doing here is uh, Rails is going to do a stale, stale object error exception, and when I detect that, I'm going to reload the account from the database and send a message back to the user, and then send them back to the screen to try again. So uh, what we learned is of, of optimistic locking. So why is it called optimistic locking? Because you're being optimistic that contention is probably not going to happen. And if it does, you're just going to have them try again. Uh, the pros of optimistic locking are less contention. The negatives are occasional angry users having to try again. Uh, we didn't talk about pessimistic locking, which is the other option. And in that case, you could think of it as you, you would actually explicitly lock that account up do the work and then you'd unlock it afterwards the pro of that is it always works the downside of that is you could have stranded locks if i never came back i disappeared i'd have a lock on that account and more contention because now i gotta wait from locking unlocking 
That is all I have for you. Thank you, Joel. Very interesting and very useful in a lot of cases. Okay, we're pretty, we're a little bit over time. Sorry about that. Um, thank you to all of our presenters, uh, to Ryan and Christina and Jared and Joel. If you're interested in presenting at a future lightning talk, uh, uh, there's a document that I'll share in the lightning talk space that you just kind of sign up, you put your name, you put a pro proposed topic, or you can put no topic at all just yet. And then when we schedule the next lightning talk, I'll reach out and say, hey, you ready to present? And, and uh, we get everything uh, scheduled ahead of time. You have plenty of notice when they're going to do it. As you can see, a uh, quick five-minute talk on something you find interesting is always very helpful. It doesn't have to be a software development topic. It can be other topics if you feel like it. Um, and, <clears throat> and that is all we have for today. We're going to put this recording out there on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you've never been to the Solution Street YouTube channel, I believe it's just youtube.com slash Solution Street, all one word. We have lots and lots and lots of previous talks and things out there that we recorded, and we'll put this out there as soon as we can. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great Friday, everybody. Thanks.